Hey, Tourpreneurs, it's Mitch Bach. And just a quick note before we begin today's episode, Tourpreneur is currently sponsored by Google. We're thankful for their support of our community, and we are offering with them a completely free course helping you unlock the power and potential of Google's Things to Do program, which is specifically helping tour operators add their tours to Google in new ways that gives you new exposure and more direct bookings. To learn more, go to tourpreneur.com slash Google. And as always, show notes, more resources, links to our newsletter, our business coaching community, and so much more are available on tourpreneur.com. Now to the episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Checkfront, the booking platform trusted by over 5,000 tour and activity operators around the world. You can start your own free 21-day trial over at Checkfront.com. Welcome to the Tourpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow tourpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, here is your host, Shane Whaley. Hello and welcome to episode 140 of Tourpreneur. This is the podcast where we flatten the learning curve for tour operators and travel professionals and tour guides around the world. There's been a lot written about self-guided. Is it buzz? Is it hype? Are there operators making serious revenue out of this? I'm intrigued and I'm not ashamed to say this is a part of our industry that I don't really know much about. I experienced a self-guided tour, an audio tour several years ago in London, thoroughly enjoyed it, but I recognize that since 2018, a lot has changed with technology and a lot of the functionality has advanced somewhat since then. So it's in that spirit that I've invited on to today's show Alex Govorianu. I said that in my best Romanian because he is the co-founder and CEO at Questo. They offer city exploration games for, for travelers and locals. They've just raised one and a half million dollars in, I believe it was Series A, uh, fundraising. So fantastic news for them. However, I didn't just want to have a chat with Alex about self-guided. I am always, when I'm interviewing a guest for the show, I want to know what's in it for you. What's in it for the tour operator, okay? So I invited onto the show a gentleman who I affectionately call Mr. Episode 8. His name is Alan Rust. He is the Chief Experience Officer at America Tour Company because Alan's been shopping around for a partner with Self Guided. So I thought, you know what? Let's host a genuine, authentic conversation on today's show where we can all learn a little bit more about what Questo offers, how Alex sees the world of Self Guided, and what questions does Alan have when he is looking for a, a partner in which to sell self-guided apps? And how does he feel Questo stacks up? Because Alan has spoken to quite a few self-guided providers out there. Show notes today can be found at tourpreneur.com forward slash one four zero. Welcome to Tourpreneur, Alex and Alan. Excited to chat with you today. There's been a lot of discussion around self-guided, and by the time this episode hits the airwaves, we will have had the arrival self-guided forum. So I'm expecting all of our listeners to be uh, having MBAs <laughs> in self-guided. But before we get into this, tell me a little bit about yourself and about Questo, Alex. Hi, Shane. Hi, Alan. Nice to nice to be here with you. Well, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Questo, and Questo is a platform for city exploration games. What we do is we created this mobile app that allows people to explore cities by playing the role of a character with a mission in, in every quest of ours. And we are available in more than 100 cities right now. And every quest of ours is being created by um, a partner who can be either an independent creator, such as a copywriter or a local storyteller, or an independent creator, such as potentially Alan. Yeah, and that's why we've invited Alan on the show today. We're going to have a conversation from the tour operator side. What's the benefit of working with self-guided app technology? Tell us a little bit about some of the characters currently on Questo that people can play. Oh my God, where to start? Let's start with my favorite one. You will be playing in Zurich in Switzerland as someone who will meet Einstein. 
and uh, you'll be doing some sort of journey back in time. Uh, you'll be walked around Zurich with Einstein. And Einstein will do a lot of thought experiments with you along the way. Uh, the quest takes for about two hours to solve. And at the end of it, you basically will understand how he came up with the idea of general theory of relativity. Because he's explaining that to you in some very simple terms uh, along the way by giving you all sorts of uh, trivia questions or puzzles or riddles to solve. And at the end, basically, our users are thinking, oh, I could have thought that by myself <laughs> if I wanted to. <laughs> That's a, it, it's, a funny, it's a funny way of putting things. But the main, the main purpose for, for me personally, because I, I was really involved in into building that course, it was a, kind of a mission of mine. I always wanted to see if I can convert the actual walking around the city also into a science experiment of some sort. And I, I was passionate about physics also, so I tried to see if, if it works, and it works. Uh, you can actually use it for, for, those, for those purposes as well. But at the same time, with every place and every riddle that you solve along that quest, you also see some places in Zurich, and we also give you the real stories about them. So it's not just the fiction and the science. It's also some legends that we share to you about some places in Zurich and stuff like that. Is your background in science? Not even close. I finished management and marketing. No, but uh, I'm, I'm a fan of Richard Feynman. That's what brought me into science, that guy. I just asked because I was on a clubhouse the other day and uh, there was a conversation with Johannes Reck, the CEO of Get Your Guide, and COVID came up and he has a background in, uh, I think, biochemistry or something and it's like you never know in our industry like we're all here for a passion for travel but so with someone who's like a lawyer or a dentist or whatever and you know alan was in consumer brands for a long time in marketing so it's i love finding out what people's backgrounds are i'm intrigued by what you've created around characters because that to me is something that's very different from turn it up on a tour and a tour guide is basically doing what i call showing up and throwing up which is just saying this building was erected in 1840 uh, Napoleon had his breakfast here. Or whatever. It's like, you know, when you go on this character, you know, Questo, the name is in, in the company title, right? This is a very different experience from that traditional tour guide just hurling facts and dates at you. Let me take you then a few years back in time to the moment when you came up with this idea. Neither myself or my co-founder, Claudio, had no experience in travel. We were just travelers and found some issues in the space in regards to how we explore cities. And both me and Claudio, we are the kind of guys who love to explore by themselves and have that sense that, well, I discovered this. So I wanted to somehow replicate it. But when we thought about how we can do this, we had no idea how. That's when we first said, okay, let's go a step back and look at how travel will probably look like in the future and a world in itself. And then we looked at Generation Z and Millennials, and we started thinking and do so all sorts of, of, of brain teasing questions for ourselves. What will they still use in the future? And we said, okay, they grew up with games. They will probably be using games. So let's inspire ourselves from, from gaming and see if we can add maybe a gamified travel experience in the process. And then when we actually did it, the first quest that we, we built, they didn't have the character. And that was the missing link because it was very hard for us to convince our users to play a gamified experience, but without a purpose, without a red thread that will connect places. So that's why we added on top the storytelling and the fiction, because then our users, they don't just end up at the starting point and then they think like in any other self-guided product that they have to go from point A to point B without any reason just for to seeing those places. Now they have a bigger mission on top. So they get immersed into that. And what I'm always loving to, to say is that the city, it's a real layer. And on top of it, Questo comes and builds other kinds of layers. So the one that I just told you about with Einstein, it's the Einstein layer that you can add in Zurich. And you can explore Zurich in that time with Einstein or with his friends, whatever. We can build a haunted layer in a city in which you will see a city filled with ghosts and all sorts of other creepy stuff. Uh, we can create a, a quest about Sherlock Holmes in London, uh, where you will find a lot of uh, mysteries and, and other things. But that's what's allowed by, by gamification and by a very, very good storytelling. 
because then people don't just do a checklist kind of tourism. Then they have a purpose behind. Then they know why they have to be there. And it works. I want to come back to that in a moment. But Alan, uh, you know, you are based in Omaha, Nebraska. And what comes to my mind is, would you consider creating a Questo app where you look at the <laughs> Omaha from uh, Warren Buffett's viewpoint? Because he's your next door neighbor, isn't he? Uh, not exactly next door neighbor, but he does live here. That's definitely something to consider because when the conventions do come here, there's 40,000 people that may be interested in walking his path. Yeah. You know, the other thing, uh, we were gateway to the West, so we could do a pioneer's path when they arrived to the city and what they discovered when they got to the city or something like that and do it from a pioneer's perspective. So as a hardworking tourpreneur yourself, how does this all sound to you? Because for me as a media producer, a content creator, I listened to Alex's description of the gamification app, but I'm like, yeah, I would love to do that. It sounds really cool. As a consumer, that's my viewpoint. But of course, as an operator, you have to look at things differently. So what springs to your mind? Well, so we have been doing self-guided tours. I added them because for most of our tours, we need 24 hours advance notice. So if somebody called us same day, we didn't have a product to offer them. So we simply added self-guided, which they go through a web page. It's very non-interactive. And we did book a lot of those last year. But in our annual meeting this year, we discussed that you know self-guided will continue. Plus, one of our big goals is how do we attract a younger audience, like Alex was saying, to doing history tours or even discovering the city. And that is something we we don't get. But when I talk to younger people, they're like, oh, yeah, I'd love to discover the city. They just don't think of a tour. So I think something like this is a great opportunity to attract those people and actually get them out to discover their own city, as well as visitors to the city. So we kind of started the process in reverse. We first said, look, we found ourselves a need. Let's do something. Let's, we have this cool idea. Let's build it. At the same time, as we didn't have any experience in travel, we actually didn't know what we are actually offering to people. And let me tell you what I mean by this. So as soon as we had people playing the quest, we thought that the feedback will be something like the product is fun or the quest was challenging. Uh, I love to play it with my friends, blah, blah, blah. But when travelers kicked in and they started playing us, the first thing they would say about Quest is that it's flexible. And we had no idea what that meant. I mean, for us, what do we mean it's flexible? And they just love the fact that they can start and stop whenever they want, that they were probably a family uh, and their kid was hungry or tired or whatever. They could just stop, pause the activity and continue later or they start the rating, they could continue tomorrow and, and so on. That's one thing we learned. Then comes other kinds of very utility benefits such as privacy or affordability, things like that, that we didn't know we are solving. We just wanted to build something fun. And, and second, regarding the age, we started off building something for millennials and Generation Z, but our average age now, depending per city, is more than older than 35. And we have average ages, for instance, in Vienna, which is a city more known for history, arts, culture, there the average age is above 40. And what we've discovered is that I would say the likelihood to convert a Questo user into an ambassador is higher for the older people. And that is because for them, it's a double win. For one, they are happy because they indeed explore the city, learn some stuff, saw some places, blah, blah. But second, they are happy because they did it using an app and they think it's so cool then they will start to tell to anyone that they used an app and that they are cool uh, also, and they will tell it to their kids, grandkids, whatever they have. So they are the biggest microphones for Questo, the, the older people. And we never knew they are, but the process is really easy. I mean, they already use phones. They have to just download the app and it's simple. And we, we keep it very simple always. So we are not trying to be very focused on the game in itself because that's not what's the most important thing. The most important thing is to have people finish the quest, not give them some IQ tests in the city. Nobody wants to pay for a product in order for the product to tell him that he's stupid because he couldn't solve it. That's a very big problem if you do that. I agree with the flexibility point. I mean, what we saw in 2020 was a lot of families that were simply looking for something to go outside and do with the family to stay safe. 
So we had driving products as well as walking, and they did both of those. So that was interesting. Um, the other thing I think that as well as a younger consumer, we're, we're also thinking that this could be something really good to offer for corporate groups. They could do this. And that is a big percentage of our business in 2019. So that's really another thing we want to try to figure out how we can use this for. It can. I think that the largest group that we had so far, uh, so far was some sort for a, for a team building event of Salesforce. And I think they had more than 200 people playing uh, basically at the same time <laughs> all together because there are no limits there. And we had then another group of, so at the beginning of the, of the school year in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, uh, we have a quest there and a teacher contacted us because he wanted to use one of our quests in Rotterdam in order to show to the new students coming to the city how the city looks like and so on. So he just used the quest for that. And we had, I think, 300 students playing across two days that quest with uh, multiple teachers. And the app basically allowed them also to divide into small teams so that it's COVID-friendly and, and stuff like that. So yeah, for groups, it, it works really good. And I think it's fair to say that the <laughs> one part, this is quite frustrating, but I get it. So I was looking at the app, obviously doing my prep, and I am a East German history nerd, as our listeners know, I have a podcast on that. And you had several tours that I was interested in in Berlin. And there was one about escapes from East Berlin to the West. I can't sit here in Vermont and play with it and do it. I have to physically be at the locations because the GPS kicks in and it takes me. So on the one hand, I was going, oh, that's a shame. I'd love to experience this. But then it's like, yeah, but this is designed for me in person to see these things myself in place rather than sat here in Vermont. It is. So I've been quite vocal about this. I don't believe in virtual tours. I don't believe in, in things that you do from your home in order to visit cities. YouTube is available in the market for more than 10 years. And if I want to do that, I just watch YouTube or National Geographic or whatever. If I want to explore a city, I have to be in that city. And our main purpose here is to not make people look at the phone. The phone is just an accessory that you have that might enhance your experience. What we want to do is make you pay attention to details. And here's a feedback we get a lot from locals, for instance. After playing our quests, as you might know, the traveler, when he goes into a new place, he has that urgency of visiting places. Because if I'm in a new place, I want to see some places to, to learn some new things. If I'm a local, I do not have that urgency because I think that I already know everything. And I will always say, uh, I can do this next week, uh, next year, and so on. But what locals say after playing our quest is that they actually discover things or places that they had no idea about and they were crossing on the street many times uh, for many years and now they see it totally different. And you can really play with their minds and engage with them. And after they finish one, they want the second one. And for locals, how it is, is for them, it's really a fun activity, but as a, as a social experiment. Our users, and this is something that kind of attracted naturally our, our users, uh, are not solo travelers or single users. We, in 99% of our cases, have at least two people playing together. Uh, most common are couples. Second is families with kids. And they're especially in cities regarding locals, it's groups of friends. Now, why they play with us is because they need an alternative to going to the cinema. It's also two hours. It's also about $10. Or going to the zoo or just having a random walk in the park. Then if you get the feedback from them after they finish the experience, uh, you get something like, if I would have went to the movies, I would have just watched the screen for two hours and it would have been a passive experience. If I'm in the city, I have to solve something with my wife, with my kids, with my friends, then it's an engaging experience. We learn from it. We laugh. We run. We get scared if it's a, it's a horror story in the night. It's a mix of emotions that basically walks you through the, the entire process. We once had, that was the funniest feedback that we ever got, a couple playing with us a quest. They fought for the entire quest. She said that it's on the left. He was saying it's on the right. They never agreed, but at the end, we expected them. It was in our early days, and then we pretty much expected all of our users at the end to ask feedback. And uh, the girl said that it was like 
purchasing furniture from IKEA <laughs> because it's so hard to assemble and you don't want to do it, but at the end you are happy because you did it <laughs> and you wow. will never forget it. Uh, back then, it was our quests were more challenging, but the the main idea, the main idea remains. It's something that you do together, and you remember it, and then you want to do it again. Got a quick message from one of our sponsors, and then we'll get right back to today's show. Stay tuned. Do you spend many nights sitting at your desk trying to figure something out in your booking system to make it work better for your business? With Checkfront, you'll always have access to a friendly support team who's quick to reply with a step-by-step -step solution no matter what you need help with. Find out other ways Checkfront can make things easier for you at checkfront.com forward slash tourpreneur. So how do you get over, like one of the objections I heard was, well, it's hard for me to book a Questo tour because I don't know what it is until I see it for myself. So do you have any kind of like dummy or only tests or anything that people just a shortened version go, oh, okay, I get it now. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and book. We don't have any of those. We have some free quests in some cities and we might add more of those in the future. But at the same time, we have here some, some updates in the platform in regards to how we will onboard users. We will implement in the upcoming months a more accessible system that will allow you as a new user to basically play a free quest or at least parts from it easier so that you can understand the process because this is indeed an issue for the new users who are not really convinced that they want to do it at the same time it was a non-issue for us because we are now focused more on increasing the supply that was our main priority but as, as we go, yeah, we have to open our platform as more as we can. Yeah, I just bring that up because, you know, you mentioned virtual tours and I, and I happen in the main to agree with you. However, I did uh, experience three Amazon Explore live stream tours and that was a very different experience. But I only booked those because A, it was to evaluate it on behalf of Tourpreneur because I had to know what I was talking about. And secondly, there was a Black Friday sale on, so they were half price. So I thought, okay, no excuses, give it a go. If it wasn't for that, I don't think I would have tried one of those live streams. And I have to say, I really enjoyed, we'll be having an episode of this in the future, the three live streams I did, I, I really enjoyed. And I've got certain views on them, I'll go into another day. But now I'm, if I saw another live stream tour somewhere, I'd say, okay, this is one-to-one -one with the guide. This isn't a recording on Zoom or YouTube. I get it and I get why it's the cost. But, you know, again, I think with what you guys are doing, that's the thing. People don't know what they don't know. They haven't experienced it. Once they've experienced one, like you just said, they become raving ambassadors, raving fans for you, sorry, and telling everyone, oh, you have to try this quest. We did this, we did that, we did the other. You know, Shane, that's more of a problem for locals. Because for travelers, what happens is that they already have the need to book something similar to ours, either if it's a tour guide or an audio tour, a bus or whatever it may be, or a quest. And for instance, whenever they see a quest list on an OTA or on our own website, then they take easily, more easily the decision because we have some advantages in comparison with those products, or at least we are different from them. And as, as our reputation grows, uh, for instance, on, let's say, on Get Your Guide or on TipAdvisor, and they see more reviews and so on, social proof kicks in. So when they see that it's a 4.8 rating out of hundreds of, of people, then it's not that much of, of, of an issue then. But for locals, it still is because locals are more picky. As I said, if they don't have urgency, they can delay it for as long as you want. So with locals, what works best is either offer it almost free, uh, the first one, so that you can uh, get them on board or have some friends of theirs recommending the experience. I want to get a bit more into the marketing in a moment, but I, I wanted to ask, especially with Alan here, how does Questo benefit tourpreneurs? How do you benefit tour operators? Well, we started working with business creators, as we call them, last year. We first opened the call at the Rival in, in Orlando more than one, one year ago, and it was actually not our intent. I remember discussing with Douglas before Orlando Back then, we were only discussing with uh, working with independent creators. And Douglas said, well, you're going to have a lot of business creators, tour operators in the audience. Why don't you tell them to join? And uh, I said, okay. 
let's do that. And many have started to, to show interest. Now, ever since what we understood was that a tour operator in the space has a lot more knowledge about his own city than we will ever have. And what we want to do then is to just give him a platform where he can put his knowledge at work and maybe build something for the future of, of city exploration. And how we, what we designed there was a very, very easy process for him in which he doesn't have to be focused on working on building the quest that much. That's our job. What he has to do is more in regards to the business side of it. So as soon as he, for instance, Alan, if he wants to do a quest, what he will have to do first is apply. Once he applies, he will tell us in which city or cities uh, he wants to build a quest. We also need some, some data about those cities. So why do you think those cities have potential for us? And that's specifically important right now as we are very picky with our destinations uh, because we are growing quite fast. Now, once we approve on a city, on a quest and so on, the first thing that you have to do is choose a theme. And you, as the, as the, as the business, you know best what theme uh, has the potential to sell in that city. So if it's a Sherlock quest in London, if it's an Angels and Demons quest in, in Rome, if it's a romantic quest in Montmartre in Paris, those are the themes that you might propose to us based on your knowledge. Uh, we will give you feedback on those if we have any relevant feedback. If we don't, we'll just, just follow you. Once you have the theme, you have to do some documentation. And for instance, if Alan already has some self-guided products, that's the documentation. Maybe he wants just to convert an existing product of, of his into a quest, meaning that he will give us the route, some pictures with every places, and some raw format stories. We don't want the tour operator to start thinking how to write nicer things. And no, we just need the brute, the brute, the brute story. And we will take this as a package and we will give it to one of our writers. And our writers, they are independent creators with whom we previously worked and we identified the best of the best. These people are, uh, some of them, they are writing scripts for Netflix or they are published authors. And they are really, really good at writing. And as they have already created a quest, they now know how to build one. So they will just take the information from Alan, put the fiction on top, rewrite those stories so that they will fit on the plot. And at the end, we will give to Alan the quest. He can, of course, give feedback, review it, and so on. And then we start testing it, testing it with real people. So we need at least a few people to test it in, in the early weeks in order to understand if it's a good product or not, do, do a lot of revisions, and then we start selling together. And the selling process is really transparent. We have a dual mo uh, model of incentives, as we call it. For everything that the partner sells on his channels, he's keeping 70% out of that, and we get 30%, and vice versa. For everything that we sell for him on our channels, we keep 70% and uh, he gets 30%. We do this model because, for one, we want to incentivize the partner to sell as much as they can uh, and get most of the pie as, as they can. And uh, as you see, the process is really half and half split in terms of resources allocated with the mention that once the product is live, we kind of take care of it. We do all the customer support. We have a 24 seven child support for all of our customers. So the tour operator doesn't have anything to, to do anymore unless he wants to build a new quest or improve the existing one when it's needed, because this might, might happen too. So for instance, if a location gets into renovation and users cannot solve a particular challenge there, then they, we will notify the, the business creator and he will have to, to do some changes and, and revise that. I think, you know, what I heard from feedback, that's very relevant. I know it's a test quest for you right now, but in DC with uh, what's been happening in Washington, you know, a lot of those sites are now cordoned off or fenced off. And of course, we all hope that changes soon and people can wander about freely, but I imagine that would affect the app there and then you have to go and rewrite the route. Yeah, uh, sometimes you have to rewrite the route. And it has happened. Not that often, though, because this is part of our guidelines. So whenever we tell to our creators how to choose the places from the route, we tell them, look, don't choose a house that looks like it's going to be demolished in two years. Don't choose that for your quest. You know? Think about events that might take places take place there. And if, and if when, for instance, that square is used for a lot of festivals, 
Uh, and when a festival is happening, your challenge won't be visible. Well, don't do that. Look for, for a different kind of challenge. And this is exactly what's available in our guidelines. So it's, it's really easy and straightforward. See, to me, that sounds like another benefit of working with you, because if I was to create this on my own, you've already gone in, in your last couple of years and made these mistakes or got the feedback and seen what's happening. Whereas if I'm starting from day one, I haven't even thought about squares being closed to the public because there's a pop concert on or a festival or a market even you know so i think that's good alan listening to the financials here how does that sound to you it sounds fair i, I will say that i've talked to a lot of other self-guided or scavenger hunt apps and the the thing that i run into is a gigantic upfront setup fee or cost that that makes it very prohibitive for, for a smaller operator. So Alex, what are the expenses to get everything set up? Zero. <laughs> That's a good answer. No, no, there's nothing. And I, I think it shouldn't be anything. We are very performance driven. If we make money, we both make money. If we don't, that's it. So then the other question, I'm gonna go back to what you earlier kind of talked about is being picky on cities right now. I did attend a Questo webinar after arrival and it was my perception that you weren't looking to add smaller towns. And I know I've seen that in the Facebook group for Tourpreneur as well. There, People are wondering what cities, and I know my city is certainly not as big as New York City. So I guess you, you did say you're open to looking for more cities, but like, what's the timeline based on different cities? When we assess a city, we basically have to listen to our tour operator. I'll give you the example that we just had a few weeks back, a tour operator from Portugal. I don't remember the exact name of the city, but it wasn't on our roadmap, not even close. We never could have found find that city. But the tour operator, he started, he, he gave us a big description of the city and why he believes that city uh, should be in Questo, mentioning that it's a very popular attraction for a lot of locals who are living in a city that's like 50 kilometers from it. Uh, during, I don't know what festival, uh, that city has a lot of influx of travelers coming there. Blah, 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 blah. Things that we have no idea about, you know? So this is what we expect from our tour operators. Just sell us your city and tell us why you think that city has potential because otherwise we can just say, we will go to New York, we will go to LA, we will go to Miami because that's what we can find. But if you have knowledge about others, please do share it with us and we are more than happy to, to join you. That's good. Yeah, we all know our cities and I, I do think this is a, a great way to get locals and visitors to both discover the city, so. As of today, what I can say to you about the funnel is that as we are more focused on travelers at the moment, due to many considerations, supply, the fact that it's an urgency matter for them and so on, what we see is that travelers, they convert into locals in time. So when they will discover, let's say that they are from New York and they have went first to LA as travelers and discovered Questo there, when they will come back to New York, they will still use Questo because they discovered it as a traveler. And then now they have a behavior, uh, kind of the potential of a habit in, in their phone, and they will continue to do that as locals. And that's, that's the main funnel that we see today. You're so right. A couple of years ago, I've only done one self-guided tour, and it was with a company that's now defunct. It was called Detour. Uh, audio, audio tours, I think they, they were doing. Yeah, they were audio. Yeah, but it was still it was still a quest. It was a spy tour in Mayfair. It, it was definitely gamified, and you had to go to certain places. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it was interesting because I think I paid I don't know something like twelve British pounds or something for that. But the day previous, I had spent three hundred pounds on a private spy tour called the Intelligence Trail in London, which was really good. I enjoyed it. But then I thought, wow, for thirteen quid, whatever it was, I've I've had this really fun experience in Mayfair. And what I liked about it was it was very well produced. It wasn't a, a budget production. It felt very authentic. And I got to see areas of Mayfair in London. Like, I'm a working-class Welsh boy. We don't go to Mayfair very often. It's an expensive part of London, right? But I got to see all these streets and areas of Mayfair that I, you know, MI5 was based there. I didn't know at the time. And all these buildings, like you say, you walk past and think, wow, Kim Philby was in that building stealing secrets and giving them to the Russians. And I learned a lot on that tour. And that was when my eyes were open. Like, oh, th this kind of technology is really fun. I get it now because I did feel immersed. 
immerse is the word here. Immerse is the word. You really have to feel immersed and you really have to have that sense that you are the one discovering that place or that story. That's our main yeah. purpose. And if you feel that, then, um, as I will say at arrival, uh, as you said, probably this podcast will appear after, but now giving a bit of a spoiler, I think that the conversation shouldn't be about self-guided tours, but about how to create some immersive city exploration experiences or at least by creating a city experience and immersive just to be implicit in it because just self-guided self-guided it's also following a map it's also using google for going from place to place that cannot create a behavior that cannot make you that happy you know it's very very limited in, in potential but when you can tell me a nice story and when you make me feel that, I do it. Uh, another favorite quest of mine is in Rotterdam. It happens in the Second World War. That's the plot. And you are a Dutch spy that has to find the German spies living in the city and prevent the bombing of Rotterdam. So for who doesn't know, Rotterdam was completely erased from ground up during the Second World War. Only one building kept standing. And your job now is to save the city. And during it, you will receive some audio transmissions by radio from, from your fellow spies. You feel like in a Mission Impossible kind of quest. And yeah, you manage to, to save the, the course of history and by, by discovering those places. It's, it's really, really fun. It is fun. And what I liked about marketing from Detour in particular was I remember I landed in Berlin a couple of months later, and I had a push notification on my phone that said, oh, here are the three tours that Detour has in Berlin. And I thought that was a very effective use of marketing because I probably hadn't have thought, oh, I need to see what that company has. In I was there for work, admittedly, but still, I really liked that. Oh, yeah, I really enjoyed that, that tour in London. Let's see what they've got nearby. Let me ask you, how are you going about uh, or what best practices are you seeing when it comes to marketing quest? Or are you recruiting influencers, any, any kind of push notifications? How are you getting the word out there that there are tours available? Uh, long story short, we are really relying right now on word of mouth a lot. We weren't focused on doing any marketing at all for various reasons, but probably the most important one was that we were focused on the product and the content side. So from day on, our vision was that in order for Questo to have potential to grow and to become a habit kind of app, it needs a lot of supply. People have to have what to play. And even today, we do not have as many quests as we want. So there are many cities in which you have only one quest or at least or maximum of two. London, happily, just two hours ago, we had a, the weekly status with the team. And finally, we have a, a more than 10 quests in London, which is our probably one of the top three potential cities for us in the future in terms of how many stories you can find in London and how many places are worth visiting. So London is it's one of the biggest playgrounds in the world. Yeah, it's a good walking city as well, Alex, isn't it? It's exactly. like it's easy to walk around London. Like LA is a bit more difficult. You probably have to use transport. Yeah, yeah. New York as well is a good walking city. DC is a good walking city. New York itself, uh, to, to share a bit about our strategy, New York and London for this year are probably our most important cities uh, because we believe that at the current state, they have the biggest, biggest potential for us in terms of also thinking what kind of themes you can build. So just when I'm thinking of New York, I, I, I was actually there one and a half years ago and I was thinking only that if I'm doing a quest for every movie that was shot here, it would be amazing. Oh, I will have a lot massive. of potential. And with exactly those kinds of themes, uh, you can create immersiveness very easily. You know, I can be Kevin from Home Alone walking in New York. I would do that. I would do that immediately if, if, <laughs> I, could, if I could be Kevin or uh, whoever. Coming back to marketing, so word of mouth a lot, that means that we really focus on discussing with customers and trying to understand what works and what doesn't work. Uh, what we learned, and this is something that I'm happily sharing with everyone, is that you get the biggest insights from the people who give you poor reviews. And those are the people who actually you can convert the easiest into your biggest fans. So right now, if I would pick top 100 fans of Questo, I 
can say with, with the hand of my heart that probably 50% of them, they previously gave us a one or a two star rating. And our job was only to go back at them and ask them why. Why did you do that? Yeah. Because why you have to ask them, you have to think a bit about what Questo is. So as you said, you have to go in the city. You have to allocate some time to do that. You have no idea what it is yet. It couldn't convince you. And then you have to walk in the city, solve something. And after two hours, bam, you have the experience. Now, if that particular person, after doing all of this, he put effort into giving me a review and telling me that what I did wasn't satisfying, then it means that for him, it, it cares. So he cared, he cared for it. So I should ask him, what can I do to, to improve this? And people, in all honesty, they do not expect for you to reply and to care because almost nobody does that. And when they see that I'm asking them, why did you to love it? What can I do different? They are shocked. And then they start telling you, but this was too long. This was too blah, blah. The app didn't work there. What's the most common uh, bit of feedback you were getting? In the early days, it was about the challenges. In the early days, our main mistake was focusing too much on the gamification side of it. Right. And as I said, giving IQ tests to people. That's not what you should do. The, the most important thing, if someone is paying for it and he's allocating two hours of his time to do it, then he has to be able to finish it. Because if he gets to challenge number five, uh, the middle of the quest, and he cannot solve that, he will think for the rest of his life that the next challenge would have been the best. And he missed it because of you, because you are a crap yeah. So what our job then was to just implement some fail saves, as we call them. So we added in the app an option to ask for an extra hint, which is like a, a dummy hint. Uh, if 99% of people will just solve it after they, after they see the hint. And if you still cannot solve it with a hint, you can use our 24-7 chat support and ask one of our colleagues, I am here, I cannot do this, blah, blah, blah. And maybe you cannot solve it, not because... Uh, of yourself, of your skills or whatever, but because as I said, there's a festival in town and the challenge is not visible anymore. So that's why you need to add 24 seven child support. You cannot just let it there. And now what we still have is a lot of things that are more into how can I get there? Can I invite multiple friends? Can I do it anytime? Uh, even though we say that it's self guided and stuff like that, people still don't believe it uh, 100% because they compare it with what exists on the market. So they will always say, but when, when does it expire? And I'm telling them, never. I mean, you purchase it, it's yours. You can play it whenever you want. Really? Is that possible? And can I play it again? Well, if you want to play again, yeah, you can, but not many people want that. But yeah, you can. Want to do it. So yeah. uh, coming back to what you said right in the beginning, it's a matter of education. We really need now to educate people into how to use these kinds of, of new experiences, which are new to anyone, for us, for the businesses, and for the consumers, most and foremost. So you talked about New York, and you see New York as a growth area. So let's say one of the best tours that I went on in New York was a walking tour. It was a post-punk rock history tour of New York City, which was phenomenal. Like I loved it for the reasons we talked about earlier on. There were certain buildings where, hey, that's where the Ramones played their first gig or, or whatever. So let's say I am that company and I'm listening to you today and I'm like, oh, this sounds a really cool idea, but I don't want people to go and pay for my $15 self-guided Questo app. I want them to pay the 100 bucks to come with me personally. What would you say to that tour operator who's worried about losing their one-to-one -one private business to an app? Uh, I would say to them what uh, Douglas from Arrival told me when I first went to him to ask for feedback. So uh, after the first Arrival event in Berlin in 2018, I went to him and I said, look, we have this idea. We have no idea what travel is. Uh, we are here at Arrival just to understand the space and to see uh, what are the ingredients. And can you please share with us some insights or your view on this? And Douglas said something like, well, many have tried. Most of them failed. Nobody really managed to do something here. What I can tell to you is the following, that 50% of people, they go on tours, 50% don't. You have to really understand whom you're serving. Is it the 50% that go already on tours or is it the other ones that, that don't? What we understand now, 
is that we serve both. For the 50% who don't go on tours, it's self-explanatory. They want to be by themselves anyways. They want to explore, blah, blah. For the other 50%, it's not like I'm replacing tour guides. It's more like I'm adding a complementary product, which is fresh and which feels most of their time, which is self-guided anyway. So yes, if I am a guy who goes on tours and I'm going for now, uh, for instance, to Paris, I'm spending there five days. How many tours can I go to? One, two, three. The actual number doesn't really matter because my units of time are limited. So I can spend, let's say, six hours in five days going on tours. But 99% of my, of my time will be self-guided anyway. And in that time, it's when I can do a self-guided experience. And that self-guided experience can be then used if I am a tour operator to drive people into purchasing my tour guide. Because Questo can help you up to a point, but for all those people that want to have a live interaction with a guide, either if it's a private uh, tour guide or if it's a large group one, they will still want it. I'm not replacing that because that's the need of meeting people and so on. What I'm helping you is target most of people's times when they are traveling, which is self-guided anyway. Can I gift somebody a Questo experience? We have a lot of people who do that. So they purchase the Quest directly yeah. and then the, they invite uh, the users. And we, all actually, we are actually working now on a, on a gift feature that will make the process more seamless. Because that's what I felt was missing with, with Amazon Explore. And I think that's, you know, it's such a good gift to give someone. If you know someone's really fascinated in, say, Pompeii, and you can send not just here's a gift card or a book. It's like, here, you go and go on this tour. And, and I bring this up because, as we know, um, I run a podcast all about East Germany history, and I have listeners in Berlin, and I would love to send them a gift of the Questo app so they can go and do that. And I can interview them and say, hey, tell us, what was it like? And, of course, that's really good marketing for you. It's really good content for the podcast, but it's also helping people that um, are visiting a city to go, oh, that Questo app, so-and-so said it was good that word of mouth promotion that you were talking about earlier on. Exactly. Well, what I can do, uh, I can unlock the quest for you and you can send uh, invites to your friends in Berlin to, to play that quest, which by the way, is one of my favorites. And I've read all the stories uh, that are shared during that quest. It's a, it's a quest about the greatest escapes from East Berlin. And you will find some amazing, amazing stories about how creative people were actually to, to escape the wall using parachutes, using a train, using a lot of tunnels. It's really, really amazing. Don't stop me on this topic. We'll be here for another hour. I have to, I'm a geek on this. Alan, what questions do you have as we wrap up here? What I would like to know, and maybe there's tour operators that haven't really looked at Questo yet, what are the components as the visitor is using the Quest? Or is, it, is it just pictures? Is there video available? Is it audio? Is it just written copy? What, what all makes up the Quest? Most of it is text at the moment and whatever other assets we are using, they always have to fit in the theme and in the plot. So to give you an example, uh, in the Rotterdam quest, as I said that you are receiving those uh, radio transmissions, there we also use audio because it fits. But when I'm speaking about the medieval quest in Vienna uh, and I'm a knight in the 1700s during the plague, I'm not receiving any radio transmission because radio doesn't exist. So we always are very careful to not getting the people out of the immersive experience. Uh, but you can use those. The, the platform supports them. So creativity is, is unlimited here. Future thinking. One other thing I've, I've read a lot about in the self-guided space is, and I know this isn't now, but augmented reality in this type of experience. Is that something on the future roadmap? It is, Alan. We actually tested AR more than two years ago. However, there are some, I would call them challenges, and not particular on our end, but on technology's end and consumer's end. Why we haven't advanced with AR is that if I'm adding AR in the app, I will then, one, not create yet a very seamless, better experience at the moment. It's very custom yet to do anything in AR. It's also very costly and so on. Right. But at the same time, for the user, it wouldn't have improved that much the experience 
uh, and at the same time, probably it would have uh, made the experience harder to play. That is because they will have to download a, a bigger app or a bigger quest. Then it will consume much more of their battery, things like this. And whenever we made the choice, we said it's like in Maslow's pyramid. Let's first think of, on what's the most important thing for them. And the most important thing for them is to finish the quest, to play offline, to have their battery not trained during the quest and stuff like that. Now technology is getting better and we actually hope that by the end of the year, we will have some AR integration, but in a very, very basic form. And first and foremost, more to use it as a test. I still think it can enhance the experience, but I do not want to make an experience in which people are just looking at their phones in the city because that's not my purpose. My purpose is to make them pay attention to details outside of their phone. I really agree with you. And from a local's perspective, they, like you were saying before, they walk around the city and don't realize what's there anyway because they're probably already looking at their screen. We don't need to encourage that more. They need to notice the thing they walk by every day. Exactly. So, uh, Alan, how does Questo sound to you? Something that you'd like to work with? Yeah, definitely. I think, it's, uh, I think it would be a good fit for us. We've just got to think of the right themes to, to make it an interesting quest in, in each city. See, I keep, I keep going back to the Warren Buffett thing. Who, who wouldn't want to go and do the Warren Buffett tour, right? If you could, I don't know, I'm just thinking top of my head. He's a very basic man, so it's not the most interesting tour, to be honest with you. <laughs> but but yeah. uh, we could definitely do something. I, you know, there are a lot, of, a lot of reasons in smaller cities where it's big conventions or sporting events that come, and they do need something to do in between what they're there to visit for. Marvelous. Uh, Alex, for those tourpreneurs listening in today who are intrigued, they want to learn more, they want to work with you, what are the next steps? So they just have to go to questwap.com slash creators, uh, creators room, and there they have all the information. The information is actually layered on, on three different dimensions. I would call them one, what's the deal for independent creators, what's the deal for business creators, and what's the deal for tour guides? We make a, a, a small distinction there. But um, just go there, research all the information. If they need any uh, help or if they have any questions, just drop an email at uh, explore at questjob.com or just use our chat support available on the website and a colleague uh, will respond very shortly to them. Fantastic. I will add all those links to the show notes, which will be found at tourpreneur.com forward slash 140. So it's just left for me to say, Mult norok mutimesh. Merci. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Thank you both for coming on the show today. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. Thanks a lot for inviting us, Shane. Thanks for listening to the Torpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit torpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Torpreneur.